Okay, we're learning the dinam about uh, marriage, who you should marry. We learned about the names, the similarity of the names. Um, halacha, by the way, believe it or not, Halacha says you shouldn't marry for money. If you only marry for money, your kids are not so good. That's what it says. Okay, another din over here. Another din over here. Shh. This is a Gemara, Dr. Rebbe brings it down, Kitson brings it down. It says a person should be extremely careful in the respect of his wife. Why? Because the brach in the home is in the merit of the woman. Therefore, Rava says in the Gemara, in Bab Metziah, Rava says, he told the people from his city of Mechuzah, that was the city where Rava was the, was the Rav, he says, Kabdun neshveser b'shvoshet tesashru. You should honor your wives in order to get rich. Okay? So now, the another important thing is like this. If a couple's married, and this happens many times and people are even unaware of the halacha. If a couple is married, they're not allowed to live together unless if there's a ksuba. Okay, which is not a marriage contract. A ksuba is the halachic responsibilities that a husband has to his wife. Feed her, clothe her, heal her, take care of her. You know, all, all the things that are needed to be done. And, and the din is that if a couple, let's say, don't have a ksuba, or the case is what they had a ksuba, but they lost it. What happens many times, people don't know where the ksuba is. So the halacha is, they're not allowed to live together if they don't have a ksuba. So what do you need to do? So there's a ksuba, what's called a ksuba de irchasa. There's a special text of a ksuba that's called suba de irchasa. Irchasa means lost. There's a special text of a ksuba that if you lost a ksuba, you go to the rabbi and he fills out the special text, but what does that text say, basically? That this person married this, this woman, this man married this woman on this and this date. And they had a ksuba. And they lost a ksuba. And because you're not allowed to live with your wife if you don't have a ksuba, so therefore we're rewriting the ksuba like the original text of the ksuba. But what should a person do until that happens? It could take a few days until that happens. So the then is, the husband has to actually give the wife <clears throat> either, he doesn't have to physically hand it to her, he has to give her collateral <clears throat> of something expensive in the house, uh, which is the value of the ksuba, that this is collateral until they write the ksuba. In other words, the ksuba is a marriage document that protects the financial and the physical well-being of the wife. And therefore, the Chacham said, if you don't have the Ksuba, the woman's not protected, and therefore you, you, you must write a Ksuba. Who signs, who signs this Ksuba? Then you have two new witnesses to from that. today's date. Let's say somebody lost the Ksuba, and they come tonight to write the Ksuba after my, which is tomorrow's date. So the rabbi fills it in. He does a Kenyan with the Chassan, like you do by the wedding. And then you have two kosher witnesses sign, and then the husband gives the document to the not, wife. Not that they were there at the wedding. Right? No, no, no. You don't need witnesses at the wedding. Uh, you need the witnesses that are there now. At the time that you write. What? At the time you write. At the right time you write. the over there, That was a little bit off the subject, but it's pertaining to this. If we're so worried about the well-being and all this, why is there not something mentioned just in case about a gift? So that there wouldn't be these kind of issues. That is a completely different halacha question because a get which is forced by a secular court is invalid. I didn't say secular, but in the what you're sitting here saying how important it is. Yeah. That we so, have Ksuba to live. To, so to there's a whole to issue. I'm not getting into that with the prenups. There's a big halachic issue with it. But well, why not in the actual Ksuba? It should have been. If they're so worried about the woman. Because the it's an invalid, it's actually. an invalid, we don't change the text of the ksuba. No, of course not. The that. text of the ksuba is the financial responsibility, nothing else. The original one. It's not, I'm saying it. it's only the financial responsibilities of the husband to wife. It doesn't go beyond what happens. Yeah. 
about forcing a get because forcing a get becomes a halachic issue. Not forcing if the kasuba were to have it or if there was. It would force it, then you'd still be forced. The guy said, I don't want to do it. Or the woman says, I don't want to accept it. So what do you do? If we're just as worried as about having. No, the financial so. responsibility. Bezdin would enforce. Like, God forbid, the Ksuba also says that if there was a divorce or death, she collects the Ksuba. There's a lot of financial, it's a total financial thing, it has nothing to do with giving a get, because if a get is forced, then it's a big halachic issue if the get would be valid or not valid and so on. Is, is a picture of the, of the Ketubah as good as the Ketubah? Let's say you lost it, they got a picture of the Basma. Uh, it wouldn't be valid because it's not the original document. What some people do when there's an official Bezdin, like in Israel and those places, they make two copies of the Ksuba. One is kept on file in the Bezdin. Then if there's a loss, they just give the original uh, copy again. But you can't have a copy of the Ksuba because just picture the story. A woman cannot have two ksubas. Why? Because she'll collect twice. Right? She'll collect twice. She'll come with one to one court and collect the ksuba, and then she'll take it to another court and it doesn't know about the first court and she'll collect the ksuba. Therefore, therefore, by the way, this this happens today by weddings. A lot of people like which in our circles we don't do that. A lot of people like to make a big fancy ksuba. Okay. Many times there are mistakes in those ksubas. Because no matter when the artist is filling it in and doing things, therefore I always tell the rabbis they need number one to pick the ksuba that they're going to be picking, make sure it's a kosher ksuba. And before the wedding, the rabbi needs to check over the already artistic ksuba to make sure that it's 100% right. Yeah? Now, what happens? If they signed the ksuba and one of the witnesses makes a mistake in the signing. Or you find out later one of the witnesses was not kosher. What do you mean not kosher? It was a relative or a totally non-religious or something like that. Yeah? So now you have a beautiful artistic ksuba that's really not kosher. Now you just can't write another kosher ksuba and leave that one as is because then the woman has two ksubas. Right? So she could collect twice. So what they would have to do halachically is write on the first ksuba, even though it's artistic and everything, they would have to write, it's not kosher. Apostle or invalid or something like that. Otherwise, a woman would be able to collect two ksubas. But which if it is, is a perfectly kosher ksuba and you read from it, huh? if, you read, if it ends up this piece of art is 100% approved by the no. and it hangs in the house, you never lose it. Well, that doesn't mean somebody can't take it. No, but I'd like to just say it's hanging. But there are such things that those are kosher. They're not totally kosher. I didn't say all of them are not kosher. I said that sometimes there's a mistake in them. If there's a mistake in it, it's not a kosher ksuba. Well, if you have two ksubas, what you say? A woman is? can't have two ksubas. Okay, what? Somebody displaced the ksuba, and now you write it temporarily. Now she has to pick a ksuba. No, if somebody... It's not a temporary... The ksuba the echasa is a not a temporary ksuba. It's a permanent ksuba. What happens? The scenario: you lose the ksuba, they can't find it, so they have to write another ksuba the echasa. They write the ksuba the echasa, and then later they find the original. So what do you do? The rav rips up one of the ksubas. The rabbi rips up one of the ksubas. I'll tell you another example. Many times, you know, many times, but a guy sometimes will divorce his wife and then he remarries her. Halachically, if she didn't marry somebody else, it's a he can re- it's, in fact, it's a mitzvah to remarry her. Okay. Unless if he's a Kohen, then he's not allowed. Okay, okay. So what happens? The guy writes, uh, gets divorced and now he remarries the woman. So number one, the rabbi needs to take away the get from the woman. Why? Because now they remarried, that original get is not kosher anymore. Correct? They, re- they remarried, now they're married. If God forbid they would get divorced, they couldn't use the old get. That's done. They would have to redo the get. 
So now, what's, what are we afraid of? One, the lady, let's say they get into a fight again. The real lady will take out her old get to prove she was divorced from this guy. But she's really not divorced from the guy. So what do you need to do, halachically? It happened to me, I did a few of those weddings. You have to take away the get from the first, the, the get that the woman had, she doesn't have it. Either the rabbi destroys it or, or keeps it, whatever, but the woman can't have it. Then if she wants to get divorced, she'll need another get. But it's a, shh, 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 shh. you can't have double ksubas, you can't have double things because it's, it, it can mess things up, uh, just from a halachic perspective. All right, next is like this. A kohen is not allowed to marry a number of women. Okay? So because of the sanctity of a kohen, he cannot marry a woman who's divorced, number one. He cannot marry uh, a zaina. What's in the not normally zaina is translated as a prostitute, but here it doesn't mean a zaina. When the title says zain isha zaina v'chalolo lo yikochu, a zaina means a woman who had relations with somebody she would not be allowed to marry. If a woman had relations with somebody she would not be allowed to marry. That automatically invalidates the woman from being able to marry a Kayan. So for instance, which is in, in the Balchuva world very, very common, if a girl on campus or not on campus, whoever, had relations with a non-Jew. Now non-Jew you can't marry. So that would invalidate that woman from marrying a Kohen. Now if it was a Jewish boy, Technically, she would be allowed to marry him, even if they don't get married. But, therefore, that wouldn't invalidate the girl from marrying a Kohen. Unless, God forbid, if it would be incest. If a brother had relations with a sister, so because she, the sister can't marry a brother, so that woman, the sister now, would not ever be allowed to marry a Kohen. So a Kohen is a certain status. Um, and by the way, even if, God forbid... The din of a zaina is not even if the woman didn't do it willingly. God forbid a woman was raped by a nanju. Yeah, she cannot marry a kohen, even though it's against her will and she couldn't do anything about it. The fact that she had relations with somebody she would not be allowed to marry that would disqualify her from from marrying a kohen. Um, what? So what happens? If, what happens if the woman did marry a kohen? Are the children then non kohens or are they? The, the, the children would not be a kohen. Just like if a kohen marries a divorcee, right? right? So there's still, halachically, they have to divorce because they're not allowed to stay married. If they have kids, those kids are not kohanim. In fact, if there's a boy, he can go to cemeteries, he can become impurified, you don't give him a kohen aliyah. That daughter cannot marry a Kohen either. She has a din of a chalolo, meaning she was desecrated because her mother and father, the Kohen and his wife, were not allowed to be married to each other. So let's say a Kohen marries a divorcee, or a Kohen marries a woman that was with a non-Jew, right? That daughter would not be allowed to marry a Kohen. That son is not a Kohen. Not a Kohen at all. In addition to the fact that they would have to um, get divorced. Okay, now, okay, now there's another din. This is not a biblical din. The case is, can a Kohen marry a girl whose father is not Jewish? So she's a full-fledged Jew because the mother is Jewish. Nevertheless, there's what's in Shonarch it says like this. It's called a blemish, the fact that the father is a non-Jew. Therefore, lechatchila, that means to begin with, she cannot marry a Kohen. If by mistake they didn't realize, they didn't know, whatever, and she married a Kohen, she doesn't have to get divorced. If a Kohen married a divorcee, a woman that, a Zainad, that means a woman that had relations with somebody she would not be allowed to marry, then the din is they have to divorce. Halachically, they have to divorce. This case, because it's rabbinic, it's only lechatchila. Another shchunar says lechatchila, 
a girl cannot marry. In fact, there was a case here in the city. There's a Kayan got engaged to a girl. And after the engagement, they found out that the girl's biological father was an angel. They didn't know that before. So because it was before the wedding, they weren't allowed to marry each other. If they would have found that out after the wedding, then it wouldn't matter. The kids would be clear on him, the kids would be fine. Yeah. You know, if whatever happened, they got married, even though they weren't supposed to, in that case, huh? In a case like that here in town, the boys, the father is a client, and the son is, the last one is a client, but he doesn't act. Well, what's the problem over there? His mother's father is not Jewish. His mother's mother's Jewish. Halachically, he has a dinner of a coin. There might have been something else there. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe there's another issue that, that she was with a guy or whatever. Well, you know what I mean? What? The question is, does a Kayan have to ask? Huh? That's a very big question in contemporary halacha. How far do you have to do research? Generally speaking... What they usually do is they tell the girl if she wants to date a Kayan or if, before they date. The, the rabbi or whoever is involved will tell the, the girl. They're not going to ask her, uh, were you with a guy? It's, even though in today's world you can ask whatever you want. It doesn't matter. But what they would do, they would do is they would tell the girl, listen, these are the situations that a Kayan cannot marry and then they'll ask, are you, allowed, are you able to marry a kind? That, that's what they do today. Huh? Api, then you can rely on her. According to Allah, you rely on her. What? If he marries her, then he has to get divorced from her. Once he divorces her, does the coin still contain his status? If a Kohen, let's say, was not religious, and he married a divorcee, and then he became religious, let's say. And they divorced, for whatever reason, they divorced anyway. So the din is, if the Kohen makes what's called a neder al das rabim, he makes a public vow, not, not, not in shul, I mean, it's a Bezdin thing, that he will never marry a woman he's not allowed to marry as a Kohen, then they would allow him to become a Kohen again. If, but uh, that's only if he divorces her and he makes a vow that he's never going to marry a woman he's not allowed to marry. Then it would be allowed. Okay.